This is Susan Grimm. Things I Can Know. The year my parents met, an earthquake rocked Cleveland. Calvin Coolidge was president. Liquor was smuggled from Canada in boats. The average worker earned $26 a week. Lindbergh had yet to cross the Atlantic. Trotsky had not yet been exiled. And the Taisho dynasty was about to end. My fo mother was 14, just in from the country. She shrugs off this encounter. Before they date, Gandhi will be imprisoned, the stock market will crash, and Edward VIII will abdicate his throne. The planet Pluto will be discovered, Donald Duck will appear in his first movie, and the Cleveland Bloomer Girls will become national softball champs. How much did a gardenia cost in 1938? My father might remember. On Schaff Road, someone pinched back the plants for weeks to coax my parents' signature flowers, glassed in under Cleveland's cool skies. They drank brandy and Alexanders and pink ladies. They danced like young trees. Were Breezy, Fred, and Ginger their models? Bonnie and Clyde had already been shot dead. Before they marry, child labor will be outlawed, cave paintings will be discovered in Lascaux, and the Seventh World's Poultry Congress will convene in Cleveland. Germany will invade Austria, Bohemia, Norway, war spilling over the world like a kitchen accident hardening out of reach. In 1945, Roosevelt dies. Hitler shoots himself. The atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. Bread is 16 cents a loaf. Coffee is 39 cents a pound. And a man's suit costs 42.50. 11,945 marriages are recorded in Cuyahoga County. My parents toast with champagne in the backyard under a sycamore tree. In their photo, framed in the bedroom, my mother holds a cascade of flowers, one for each night of their nuptial drive to the south. My father still keeps these honeymoon receipts in the family Bible. From the sandy bottom of Lake Erie, the G.P. Griffith. In fairy tales, sometimes the favored mite travels in a walnut shell with a pinch of cotton fluff, some string, a geranium leaf shade, or imagining we might launch a loose curl of bark, placing inside the figure whose eyes and mouth we've embroidered, the nostrils so small we cannot stitch open their pepper flakes. But the dead, life-size, did not embark on a saucer, forget-me-nots for an anchor and chain. Greased pieces of metal, lissom teak barks, carried coal, flaxseed, flour, barrels of whiskey or apples, package freight. Ships heavy with quarry, women laden with gold. Some held their breath when they stepped aboard. Some dreaded the tilting flat on the way past Fairport, Erie, Silver Creek. Ships can founder, explode, break up in the heavy chop. Under the white caps, walnut timbers roll. Boys drift home naked and cased in ice. Pretending to be as generous as air, the lake laps feet, watercolors a sunset path to faith. It is 1850. They step aboard, futures sewn into their immigrant seams. When night falls, when the breeze lifts the hair off their warm June necks, the sparks from the cargo hold fly. Steering for shore, run aground a half mile out, the, the, the ship begins its burn to the waterline. Hundreds die, gulping their prayers or choking the side wheels. Lockets round their necks, seed in the hole. Are they fish that they should swim, islands that they might fly? Float. In the morning, bonnets, pocket knives, attendant kickshaws strew the beach. Should they have stepped away, not struggled with hull wood or boiler stoke? But the body itself is a curious packet with a raucous, lamentable crew. Even before our first alien breath, in the initial watery home, it was all voyage surprise. <laughs> Ghosts. How many times did I wake and confuse the sound of the wind in the leaves, a summer sound, restless, the green at its most extravagant, chlorophylled, the droops and plumps and tapering that can hide a bird. Before they got up, before I counted the ceiling tiles, I would think at the sound of the waves. No human voice can call so well at Catawba, returning so many times we wore the linoleum away. Hamburgers, frozen custards, the enticing TV dinner with 
its segmented tray, sweet corn stripped of its leaves, the golden teeth grinning, cheesecake from the island store, rich on its salver of foil. Nobody fished, we never went in a boat, we swam, plunging and drenching two times each day. Once, at dusk, our hair already dimming in the air, the pink of our sunburn sliding away, we entered the lake in our clothes. I remember that puckery cotton, lavender and white darkening from the bottom up in the whispering clamor. There are currents everywhere, some marked, some faithful. Feeling their pull, even now, I see how mothers stretch their love an extra generation that I might reach this century with still some muscle and egg. Solid like a river. I have never been in a wheat field. My family was mines and trains and steel. I imagine a field of iron fences. They never grow. Their shadows and selves darker than grain. Rain is unnecessary. Camouflaged pigeons, cross-talking crows. Much is unspoken in kitchen, in bedrooms. They do not think of the self as a barrier. Tram tracks. Pickle Hill. In the morning, they go down into the flats where the river thickens and molten steel flows, armed with their two arms. What do they carry besides a lunch bucket? My two uncles, just into town, borrow from gardens, carrots and cabbage, live under the Clark Avenue Bridge. Back home, coal dust, a mine shaft, collapse. They long to step into that agitation of flat caps, downhill, not under, no pickaxe. After when. There are some that cook and some that eat and some that dye their hair. The oldest stays upstairs, drops an annual note through the rails. The youngest keeps changing chairs, outlasting the candles and the wood. All the old mirrors settle down in their boxy aprons, knots in the ties. Boil some potatoes for just these six, gossiping in pairs, slouching or elbows. They run through a skit of their parts. Who gets to tell what joke? They slip their heels out of their shoes. Coffee, toast on a stick. All the dead ants in their skull caps of gray. Outside, a forest of sycamore thickens. Something threshes out of the sky, humming like a rare cancerous toy. The sister in the eaves swears. She is tired of being first, of waiting for the rest to bumble out, pin their tongues and skirts up, clarify at last the barracuda in the evening shrubbery. The Lost Predella. What I was then was an endangered species, ferret of civility, whippet of dishwater and disbelief. My body trembled with wanting. Thunderstorm in a bright sky, I called it to me and looked away, dressing up in basements and giving some tongue. The new world started with Kiana, stretchy for all our floor-length gowns and disco shirts sexual hopscotch, and outside the world shining and the future echoing away, I could only hear my body, my skin rubbing up a buzz against the air. Horizontal, cigarette butts in the specimen drawer, and then womb, carefully chosen and chosen twice. Picture this, double stroller, kindergarten, and all you know, like a comic strip under this poem. Some kind of transformation, but not like the Greeks, half woman stalking the grocery, harpy feathers in the wash machine, antic figures. After the shy flowers on the mystery vine, this is the caption, to my surprise. Swimming out of season and behold. 
Maybe you've read my poem about the orange bathing suit, but there are many ways to say the same thing. At the outdoor pool, the wind blows steadily out of the west, making a current as if this were a stream or a river replete with a swim team that shivers on the edge. For even a municipal pool can have big dreams, yearnings towards dark forests and white water runs in a narrowed river bed, a little like champagne along the legs, not bad, and the clouds moving like a frolicsome dream of silent buffaloes. This goes with the seven lean years, work hard, get strong, let sorrow roll off your back. And it came to pass that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Exodus comes next, but my dream is backwards, or its prediction, or the months that it already took. The seven lean flesh cows have eaten up the good of the world. Here's the meadow stripped and me incomplete. I pick up the bits of the world and press them to my cheeks and eyes, and even though we are not pure, still our longing opens like the bell of the lily's throat. Old Madonnas. We end up seated on a log side by side like twin deities or old Madonnas or opposing points of view. Our butts are cold and we've turtled our hoodies to pucker around the face. Half of the beach is gone and the waves thrum and boom rolling toward us. If it never stopped, if the earth kept writing to us in seaweed, if the clouds kept parting, the sun lacing our shadows with the standing trees. Spare of pebbles and stones, an old corn cob, charred bits of wood, you in your barn coat and me in my red, were seven layer cakes of flannel and sweats. Everything roiling around us, shifting, the wet sand reflecting the blue of the sky. Far out, the waves race towards each other like springtime bulls. Loud and ch cold and charged with light, the wind, all the voices we need, one stone in the pocket for proper weight. Under our hoods, our hair twitches to rise. We have come together like pincers, quizzical eyebrows blown back, foreheads unwrinkled as sand, the trees scraping and slashing behind us. What do the fish in the lake feel, the day hiccuping above? Pea-green grid with its tiny cups of blue, the trash of the world thrash sailing over their heads like crazy ceiling fans, condoms, fence posts. A deer crashes through the woods, our skin buffeted into compliance, a tiny spiral making its way into our lungs. Wallop me clouds, shake out my hair, and blow off my gloves.